All right, welcome guys. Um, what I'll do today um, is I'll start out to make sure, uh, just to make sure um, everyone who's here has a chance to get through uh, an introduction to our assignment two. So I'm, I'm, I'm chugging my way through assignment one stuff so far. Um, so, um, but I want to take you to take a look at assignment two. <coughs> so assignment two um, is called Judging a Book by Its Cover. So I'll zoom this right up. So what I want you to do is um, uh, select an existing book title. So new or old, it doesn't have to be a recent release, it can be an ancient release if you want, I don't care. Um, I want you to design a single landing page for that book that will serve as a destination for an advertising campaign. Okay, so imagine that you clicked on through on an ad, uh, pushed through LinkedIn or, or some other you know, a Facebook channel or something like that, and you landed on this, this page. So this would feature all of the compelling reasons why you had to have this book, right? So um, I want you to power this using the Bootstrap uh, CSS framework as we've been working on. Um, give me some real content this time. Find images of the book cover, the author, you know, pictures of the author, some other supporting imagery. Um, find some real book reviews. Look at, look up those those reviews, maybe on Amazon or something like that. So feel free to kind of pill for those. Um, and then lay out a simple grid-based page. So I want to cover the the book cover, the author, at least three reviews, and a, a synopsis. So a kind of a quick and dirty of overview of what the book uh, is all about. A, buy, a, a simple buy now form, so simple, you know, simply maybe just a button. Um, uh, publisher's information and maybe some other information about about the the book. Um, I want to see a, a, na a navigation bar, uh, a, a carousel, an accordion, and a tab panel as well. Okay, so you have all the skills that you need to build all of those components. At the very least, I want to see that. Um, I need to see clean, semantic, uncluttered HTML. Um, and I'm, in marking through some of the assignment one, I'm still seeing people submit to me non-valid HTML. You have to validate your HTML. You can't expect CSS to render properly if you have broken HTML. Okay, that is the very, very low-hanging fruit. Right? If you're submitting me broken HTML, I'm not going to spend a lot of time evaluating your CSS, right? Because it's not going to render properly. You need to validate your HTML. So clean, um, uncluttered, well-formatted, well-commented HTML. Please and thanks. Um, I want to see some interesting web fonts for your headings, or maybe even for your body text. That's what we're going to cover today. Um, I want to see all of your CSS and JavaScript separate. Move that into separate files. Um, and don't have fun with this one. Don't be afraid to experiment a little. I'd much, I'd much rather see you try something and break, not quite get it right, maybe break it, then not try at all, right? And, and it just give me very a very simple and very basic submission. I'm not going to penalize you for trying something challenging, right? Um, uh, you know, I I, I want to re I, the the the, um, the assignment criteria are, are are designed to reward that kind of effort. So, um, um, here's some I here's some things. Um, you know, why am I doing this? So this is uh, uh, I guess my num my numbering's broken. I've got to renumber the that's weird. Um, these are some of the things that we're <coughs> attempting to learn, and this, this assignment supports that. Um, so I need to see a link. This needs to be on a, on a server, right? On a live server. This needs to either be on a, at your DreamHost server, uh, spin up at one of your Azure servers. It has to be live. I need a URL. Um, OK, so that's cool. Um, anyway, yeah. so the, the focus on this is going to be layout. I want to see, make sure that the uh, the page responds. So think about mobile first, right? Shrink that page down. Use the browser tools to, to simulate a phone. Uh, throw it up on a server and try it on your phone. Look at how does it look on in a single column view? Is it usable there? Then look at the small layout, the medium layout, and look. And um, you know, I've, I've also got some some assignments in where you know the assignment assignment one was based on the grid, and I've got assignments where you don't, you're not using those grid classes, right? The, the whole idea behind the grid is you start with a pencil and paper, you lay it out how you want it to look on a small, a medium, and a large screen, and then you identify each of those rows and columns, 
and you say, how wide is each of these rows and columns going to be in a small, in a medium, and in a large screen? That's the whole idea. Uh, should, can we add our own CSS? Absolutely. Okay. And I encourage you to do so, right? So absolutely, I need to see you extending that CSS, putting in your custom CSS, like, like we do in class, and maybe uh, taking, you know, moving that beyond the basic bootstrap styles. I mean, if all we ever used was bootstrap, and we never customized it beyond that, every single site would look like a bootstrap site. Right? No good. Right? So absolutely take it beyond that. But but use those um, use those those rows and the classes for the columns to lay out a grid. That's what I want to see. And I want to see I want to see it work well in a in a single column for a mobile. I want to see you take advantage of a little extra space with me with a medium layer or a small, medium, and a large. Right? So think about how you can rearrange those things in terms of your rows and columns. Um, yeah, <clears throat> that's cool. So let, let's just see, when do I want this back by? I want this back by, so um, if you click on, if you're, unfortunately it doesn't publish the due date there. It does in the calendar, so I've got the, the course calendar here. Uh, Friday, November 3rd, okay, is, uh, and it's out of 50. Okay, so please, and if, if you're, un like, read the, read the assignment. If there's anything that's unclear, please send me a note, like, you know, um, ask me. Just uh, I'll I'll tell you. You know I'll I'll clear things up for you so you're not spending a lot of time on things that you don't need to be spending time on. Um, is it number three or do you sorry? Is it number three or do you three? Sorry, it's that. No, it's okay. I yeah. Know, I, I, <coughs> Hang on. Yes. I haven't, <laughs> I haven't seen the eye doctor yet. I really should. Um, that's a little bit small. That's not fair, perhaps. Um, Presentations. So the next thing I want to draw your attention to is presentation one. <clears throat> so this is called Bootstrap Components. So obviously we've gone through some of the user interface uh, components uh, that are very popular in Bootstrap. You get a, you've got a sense of what the documentation is like, what kind of generic code they give you to kind of customize. Usually it's a sea of divs that you're supposed to kind of customize to to your particular application, um, but there are there are a ton of different components in Bootstrap, a ton of them, right? Um, and sometimes that people have even kind of come up with combining two components <coughs> to make up some other new interface, right? Um, as we've done. So what I want you to do is pick a go through the Bootstrap documentation, pick a component that we didn't cover in class, okay? And then I want you to do is. Uh, Read up how you get it working, right? Produce a little bit of a little bit of CSS and a little bit of, of HTML. Produce a simple prototype. Get it working yourself. Get comfortable with it, and then show us, right? Make a short screencast, and I mean short. Don't give me a 25 minute. It's easy to do. It's give me short. I want 10 minutes tops. Walk me through. Show me the code. Do the screencast. Show me how it works. Show me how you might be able to get that going, right? I know it's terrifying. You know, being, recording yourself on the screen, I get it. I do it all the time. <laughs> it's good. It's it's yes. yes it's short is too short. Too short? Well, if if you're under five minutes, you're probably not going into enough depth because every component has has little gotchas and little little ways that you can customize it. And there's little there's little interesting ways you can kind of extend it or do interesting things with it. So show me some of the maybe some of those features. Um, uh, I'm not expecting you to videotape yourself, so I don't need to. I mean, uh, um, you know, you're a great-looking crew, uh, but uh, I want to see your code, right? So um, feel free to use any tool you want. Screencast, Screencast-O-Matic, which is which I've been using for this whole class, is, is free. They have a free one. It's it's very easy to use. Um, it, it doesn't cost you a, a thing, and it's great. Yeah. So basically, are we going to screencast the code? Are the application like? Uh, and we can explain it, or we can screen the code and stuff like as you do in class. Yeah, kind of. If you look at my screencast, that's a model for what I want to see. So I want to see on the screen, I want to see you working with the code in whatever code editor you want, and explain to me what each part does, right? As you're kind of building it. So build it first before you screencast it, obviously, so you have a good sense, right? And then kind of you know write a little bit of a, a plan on a piece of paper, and and then you know don't overthink it. It doesn't need to be perfect. Um, screen. Screencasting, the reason why uh, explaining uh, these things is good for you is because very often you're going to be in a situation 
where you have to explain to a team of people why you want to do something or how it needs to be done, right? Or, or what, are the, what, are the, what are the advantages of such a thing? So you're going to need to sell. I mean, no, you're not all going to be in sales, but we all, to some extent, just, we need to sell our ideas. And doing this is very, it's very helpful. It's challenging. It's, it's, like, it's weird because even when you're all by yourself in your, in your room or, 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 or closing in a, in a, in a you know, one of the, the working pods here and, and the door's shut, nobody's listening to you. You turn on the record button, it's like, it makes you sweat, right? It's, it's a very strange phenomenon, but it's, it's just, you know, um, you can take as many takes as you want, right? Um, but uh, we're, and then I, what, what I want you to do is post this. Um, so what you do is we, you see how there's a discussion board here. Post this, click on, click through here, and I guess I better, well, I've still got last, last year's uh, presentations. Ah, you can take a look at these. I, I should clear them out, so. Um, post this up here and uh, show me, um, Give me a link to uh, uh, say to YouTube if you want. Um, you can make that a private. You can make it a private link, so it, so it doesn't have to go public. Um, if you really, really, really don't, if you're really, really un super uncomfortable with having your peers look at your video, uh, let me know, and we'll make arrangements so you can send me the link in a more kind of private way. So so don't don't feel pressure that way either. Okay. Uh, and just have some fun with it. Like sh enjoy sharing something cool and, and digging up something <coughs> a little bit maybe obscure that's uh, that might be interesting, right? The, the documentation for Bootstrap version four is very very deep, and there's lots of stuff there. And, and uh, um, how do you get a mark for this? Um, I, out of twenty five, so I'm looking that you effectively describe the component, including like what are the possible ways it could be used. Um, show me or describe and explain effectively the code. Right. Um, uh, make sure it effectively demonstrates how to get it working properly. Um, show me ways to uh, improve or customize it to your own needs, because you know every use of said component is going to be perhaps different in a different context. Um, and I'm also looking that it's lively and entertaining. I mean, you don't have to be a comedian or anything like that, right? But uh, you know, make it upbeat, right? Um, make it, you know, uh, um, be excited about it. When is this due? I'll show you when it's due. Uh, I just moved the due date. 15th. No, this is presentation two. I went the wrong way. Uh, presentation one. November 10th, Friday, November 10th. So you got plenty of time to kind of take a couple of takes, you know, outtakes, and whatnot, you know. Get, get used to kind of recording yourself in front of a in front of your machine, um, but like I said, you, you don't need to uh, unless you want to videotape your your you know your, you want to show yourself. Sometimes uh, that's up to you. But <coughs> we're just we're just looking at your code and your voiceover over the code. Okay. Let me know if anyone has any questions at all about 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 that and what I'm looking for. And hopefully, I try and keep it as simple as I can. Like you know, if if really you're like. What are you? What exactly are you looking for? How are you marketing? Well, I try and make this evaluation criteria like really, really super, super clear. Like, if you follow that as a checklist, I, you you can't help but do well on the assignment. Really, um, you know. So that's how uh, I'm very transparent about how I mark the work. Cool. All right. Any questions? Neat. All right. Let's go to learning module. So what are we doing today? Today is super cool. I'll, sh I'll tell you why. So today we're going to talk about web fonts, okay? But we're going to take it today to a whole other level. We're going to take it, this technology to a place you've probably never seen it go before. And if you walk away with some of the, some of the, the learning objectives from today's lessons, you are going to be able to produce some incredible looking work using <coughs> plain old web HTML and CSS, really, it's going to be awesome. Um, so, you know, as the browsers become more capable, um, here, I'll, I'll boost this up so you can see it a little bit more. As the browsers are, are more capable now, it, I mean, even the the uh, you know the brow the browsers provided on even the most basic of smartphones now are extremely capable. They can render fonts and and they can render in, uh, fonts that we've included from a font service using a font uh, font service API or fonts that you've included custom fonts that you've provided they can render them well they can look great 
Um, they're relatively fast, right? They're, when they're optimized for web travel, they come down relatively quick. Um, so uh, all of this is great. So, but, but the interesting thing is we, if we look at, and I'll snap over here. Sorry, the screencast won't be able to see this. I wish it could. We'll snap over to the doc cam here. So here is an example. Here is this book. Um, an interesting book, <coughs> by the way. So this is a book called uh, uh, The Life and Times of the Thunderbolt Kid by, by Bill Bryson, a very funny writer. Um, but what, what captivated me, I mean, um, we all judge a book by its cover, right? That's why they spend so much time designing covers. Right? It's, you know. Um, but what's really cool about, about this is, um, you know, the, um, it's just, it's, the design is, I mean, it hits you right away. It's got lots of, there's lots of interesting treatment of type here. Um, of course, it's embossed a little bit, which is difficult to do in a, in a screen setting. Maybe not forever it won't be. Maybe we can do that one day. Um, so we can't address that. But if you look at just, just the care and the thought and the, um, of the different font uh, face pairings that were used, some simple drop shadows, you know, some, um, it, it's, just, it's, just a, it's just a wonderful uh, graphical illustration right, to support the book. And so for the, for the longest time, of course, um, we've been able to do this in print, you know, for, for eons. D digital desktop publishing has allowed us access all these wonderful font faces and all these different things we could do with it. And for the longest time, they were just inaccessible to web folks, right? If you wanted to do any kind of front end with this stuff, you basically had to take these fonts, license them yourself, install them on your machine, head into Photoshop, and create pictures of words. That was the only way we could do it, right? Those days are gone. They're so gone. They're just gone. We can do all of this. So what we're going to do today is we are going to treat, we are going to create, recreate this entire book cover using only, using uh, nothing but words, pure text. You'll be amazed. We can do it. Okay. The other thing, the only thing, of course, um, uh, that we need is the image. So we've got a background image that I'll provide uh, to you um, from uh, from Flickr. Someone uh, has licensed a, a background image of kind of a cloudy day uh, for Creative Commons use. So I, I'll show, I'll attribute the author of that, and also the uh, uh, the stock image here um, as well. So beyond those. Um, all we need to use is text. So this is this is you will be amazed. And there are a number of ways that uh, when we're embedding uh, custom fonts like this um, to do it uh, uh, so it's reliable. We need to do it so that it, it downloads quickly. We need to do it. We need to address the cross-platform issue of, of of font files. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So how do I how do I embed? What formats of fonts do I use? What order do I put in? What does the at font face rule look like? What is the syntax? Where do I put it so it's going to work properly? Um, all these kind of things, right? So, and what are the what are the um, what are the legal implications, right? If, you know, if I if I just nab a free font from the internet, can I use that on my web page, right? Simple enough to do, but what are the things to watch for, right? Because free doesn't necessarily mean free, okay? So very important. So. We'll do that. We're going to learn at, at font face, um, and uh, and we'll have a, a, a really fun challenge at the end of the class for you guys to do as well. So hopefully you'll have a whole lot of fun. So what I've done here is I've provided with you. Well, I guess I better show this. Um, I provided you uh, with a graphical or a JPEG image of the book cover. Okay. Um, so that's uh, that is what we are going to build. Okay. So keep that. You can download that or just leave that open on your on on your uh, your tab for Blackboard. That's cool. I want you to download these lesson files here. Pull these down to module six. Believe it or not. And 
extract that to your desktop, double click on Mac or right click extract all. And inside there, get, make sure you, you trash or get rid of, where's my delete? There it is. Get rid of the zip file so you're not tempted to open that. And then inside that you should have a folder called lesson files. I don't know why that doubles it up. And some hidden files and there's your git for uh, um, the uh, store. You can ignore that on Windows. You won't see that on, on, on a Mac. So you should have, have an index uh, um, an in index page for your um, for a template and a number of folders, <coughs> CSS, fonts, images, and JavaScript. So make sure you've got that. Let's fire up a, fire up a code editor. Whichever one you want. I find this one's the most friendly for this big screen here. And we'll open up a project folder or a folder. I'll just open up the lesson files folder and there is our stuff here. Spark up index. That's a bit big, maybe. <coughs> cool. All right. So I'll walk you through the template. Very simple, and I, I, I did this on purpose. I really reduced the code down to a very, very bare minimum of markup, right? Uh, there, are, there are no uh, tags with, without meaning here. So the whole thing is we've got uh, the head section, our character encoding's in place. Uh, we've, we've normalized the style sheet. So we're not using Bootstrap. We're going to, I'm going to just, I'm going to step away from the framework for, for today just to isolate and, and really focusing on font face. So we're just, we're gonna keep this really, really, really simple and very focused today. Yes, you, you can use all, obviously we can incorporate this into a framework like Bootstrap without any issues, but I just don't, I wanna keep the code very, very minimal today so we can just focus on what precisely we're doing. So we've normalized out, uh, you know, normalize is, uh, is uh, really we need to do that if we're not using a framework. If you're using a framework, don't normalize or, or reset. Um, the custom CSS, of course, that comes after a normalization or any frameworks. Um, but look at the body. So what I've done is I've looked at the book. I looked at the title and said, okay, really um, let the content be your guide. So I've looked at this, at this, uh, this book itself. Let's go in here and, right? I said, okay, well, we've got a kind of a header here. Um, <coughs> this is a block quote, right? It's somebody's, I, I'm extracting this from uh, a guy named, a, you know, uh, Tom Brokow or Brokow. Um, then I've got, uh, I'm addressing someone's name, right? Um, and then, uh, you know, um, what other ways? So I've, I've said um, uh, author of, so the header includes the, basically, I'm, I'm saying this is the entire uh, header of the document, right? Um, so I've addressed, um, and I've add emphasis to a number of things. You know, Thunderbolt Kid, the life and times of, of, of the Thunderbolt Kid. If we look at the, um, uh, this has one, perhaps one uh, heading. Um, Thunderbolt Kid is, I said, well, that's bold, that's strong, it's strongly emphasized. So then I've got a nice hook for my styles, right? So I've thought about the content um, without really any thought to my design. Think about it semantically first, right? Um, that's cool. So let's take a look and see um, 
what we've done here. Uh, so let's open this. Uh, you know, let's start with the Chrome because I'm going to use some of the dev tools in Chrome. And we'll take a look at what I've done for you so far before we even get uh, going. OK, so a couple of things that we've done already to get going. Um, the first thing that is perhaps very interesting is the entire book, this, this entire square here, uh, if I right click on this, for example, the entire book is the body element. Right? So what I'm doing is I'm using the body as the page wrapper. Now this, I'm not saying you're going to use this in production. This is a, we're, we're doing a real, uh, we're doing something, uh, we're really pushing the technology in terms of the layout capabilities so we can see what is possible with our apps, with the front end of our apps. So you don't need to, um, <coughs> you don't need to put a div ID container, right? Uh, and perhaps with the bootstrap, I could put a, um, uh, you know, I could put a bootstrap class on that and use that as a fluid or a fixed width container. Maybe I could use the body. Um, try it, see what happens. There is a, a really, really super good article um, here that I'd like you to take a look at. It's, it's, it's um, suggested reading. It's an old article, but it, it just goes to uh, explain to you, you know, how to center and lay out pages without a wrapper. Right? This is back in, this is seven years ago. People were wondering, why do we have to add this extra markup and page weight and all this kind of, can't we just keep it simple? Yes, you can. So it's a really good um, uh, talk about uh, what's the difference between the HTML element and the body element, right? Um, so for example, if the, what's something very strange about the body is if you put a background color on the, on the body, but the body element only goes down halfway down the page, it still paints the entire viewport even though the background color is on the body. So there's some weird things in the browser that happen. Um, that's just the way browsers are built. Um, so um, if you're doing that, you may you, you likely have to set the minimum height of the body to 100% to account for times when there's not enough content to cover the page. So there's different things. So a great read if you want to kind of minimize your code and do it responsibly. Um, awesome. So we're using that. Um, let's take a look at. I've already bolted on the custom CSS. So let's take a look at that. So there's some. There's some. Oh, I, I missed that one. All right, that's OK. Um, so what do you do here? So the body. What I did with the HTML is we set the height of the HTML to 100%. If you're going to use the body as the, of the wrapper, you have to do that, right? Uh, seems strange, right? But that we want the viewport, and that's because if we're going to put a background color on the HTML, we need it to cover the whole viewport. Because browsers aren't really designed to treat HTML as the, the background. They treat the body as the background for the viewport, which is kind of weird. So you have to put set a height of 100% on the body. Um, then on the on the on the or sorry on the HTML. And then on the body, you have to say <coughs> min height 100 percent if you're going to do that. That seems kind of strange, I know, but um, it's it's for those situations where you don't have enough content to cover the viewport. You have no control. Um, anyway, I've overwritten that rule here in this case because uh, uh, I'm going to we're going to design a book a, a certain box. I've also uh, rotated the book minus five degrees, put a box shadow on it, and positioned it relative so everything else inside that can be arranged with respect to the book itself. Okay? So that's what we've done there. The header, we've aligned all the center, text in the center. The first paragraph inside the header, this one here, right? I need to treat that uh, a little bit differently. Where do I go? Come on, there we go. So we, we want that to have that nice red color, like nice red red band across the top of the book, right? Um, the address, the header address. So that is the um, 
built the word Bill Bryson, right, with the, the white and the drop, the drop there. What we've done with that is uh, put a text shadow on that, <clears throat> added a, a, a height, forced the height to that, um, and uh, set the font style to font weight and normal, and set the font size to 4Ms, right? We'll, we're going to adjust all of that. Uh, header P, all of these are uppercase. So all of the uh, paragraphs in here are uppercase. You, can, you can't really see the behind Bill Bryson, but those are all uppercase in there. We overwrite that where we want to. Uh, the second paragraph, P enthyp type 2, inside the header. We've also uh, we set the color of that text to red. So that is the author of right here, right? I want that to red. And then there's a walk in the woods is in, is in uh, a different, I've set that in black because it's emphasized here, okay? <coughs> the header H1, uh, there's some styles for that. And the header H1 strong is the Thunderbolt kid. That's that word there inside, okay? So there's some <coughs> spacing and, and sizing. We're going to manipulate that. Um, the H1EM is actually this here, a memoir. Okay? So that, that needs its own treatment and its own font face. And what else have we got here? Uh, oh, we've, so I positioned the uh, image, the, uh, uh, the Thunderbolt kid. This gets positioned with respect to the body. Which is, the the, which is the bounding box of the book. I put it zero from the bo uh, bottom of the body element, which is this book. The bounds of this book are actually the body. So I put it, I bolted this kid to the bottom here, and then uh, I think, what is it, 25 pixels? Or sorry, 25 pixels from the right hand side over here. So there's the bounding the image. So I've moved it over a little bit here and bolted it to the bottom. Position. Absolute. So it's going to be positioned with respect to the body, which is the book cover. Um, and then some other, just some uh, for this, for the block quote, for the quote from the author or from the person who reviewed the book. Um, and the body itself has a background image. We've used the background shorthand to point to that image of the sky, right? So that's all we've done. So we're going to focus now on the typography itself. How do we get this here <coughs> to look like that? Okay. We can do it, but it's going to take uh, it's going to take a little bit of understanding of how web fonts work. Um, and you've probably worked with a little bit of Google, maybe Google web fonts in the past. Um, sometimes we use these technologies without really understanding under the hood how they work. We treat them kind of like that black box. Like I just bolt that on there and it does this magic in there and it works and I get what I want. So we want to kind of demystify that black box that is first the Google fonts API and how that <coughs> works, how that's going to work for you. So this is, uh, this is cool. So step one, we want to set the base font settings to 120, where's my uh, text wrap? <coughs> so we want to set the base font settings on the body. Okay, so we'll start here. We're going to use the font shorthand. Okay, so we can set all these things separately, but we're just going <coughs> to use font. And remember though, the, uh, the order of those properties has to be just so. You can omit any one of these values, but they have to be in this order. Okay, so we start with the font style, right? <clears throat> Is that italic? Um, font variant, italic or normal font variant. Uh, you may have small caps if the font supports it. Otherwise, the browser fakes it. Um, <clears throat> for example, font weight. You know, is it bold or is it is it normal? Um, and <clears throat> font size. Line height and font family, which is then the font stack, that comma separated list of fonts that you want to use in the preference. So let's build this out. Um, if you're like me, 
uh, and you constantly forget the order of things like the shorthand for font, head over to a great reference. Um, so I, you know, one of the best maintained uh, places in terms of these references to go is the Mozilla Developer Network. You know, forget forget how it works. There we go. Right. Keep those things at your disposal. Right. On a tab. <clears throat> Tabs are free. <clears throat> Until they cause your browser to crash because you're eating too much memory, of course. That's, that's my problem. So the font. So we'll set the first of the font style. We'll set this to normal. <clears throat> we'll set the font variant. Uh, we'll ignore that one. We'll set the font weight to normal. Actually, I don't need the, uh, I don't need the, the comma. <clears throat> normal. Uh, we'll set the font size then to 120%. So we'll use a relative value. And we'll use slash 1.4 for the line height. <clears throat> it's always a good idea to set your letting or your line height to greater than 1, which is the default. And most, uh, most resets don't do that for you, so that's something that you <coughs> need to do. right? The, the default stuff's too squashed together. Now, of course, we're doing something pretty fancy, uh, so it's a little bit different, but that's cool. Then we're going to uh, create <coughs> A font stack. Okay, so that now the font or font family stack. Sorry. So this is where we have a comma separated uh, list of font uh, typefaces. We're going to start with Futura. Remember, the fonts have to be they are case sensitive. They have to be um, written exactly as they are installed on the user's machine. Futura is a very uh, commonly uh, installed font on many users' machines. I guess I'll need to put a comma after that one. So Futura, uh, failing that, let's use uh, Helvetica. So I just need a simple sans serif font. Failing that, let's use Arial. And failing both of those always end up with a classification. And finish off the rule. So hopefully we'll get Futura, reload your page, and you'll see we have, I'm not sure if that is Futura, but it certainly looks, this looks a lot closer. Um, these two in particular, these are trumped by impact. That looks a little closer to what we're looking at here. I'll close out this here. Okay. Not too bad. Cool. Step one. Step two. <coughs> now we're going to talk about Google Fonts API. So we're going to. What, we, what I'd like to do is I'd like to address the uh, this crazy font here. Bill Bryson, also the same font face used here by Thunderbolt Kid. So I want to get something that's a little closer to uh, what we're what we want here. So we're going to head over to the Google Fonts API. So off we go to uh, fonts.google.com. And this is a huge repository of very generous. Um, Typographers, uh, font designers, font foundries who have donated uh, fonts to this service, and they reside in this service for you to use. Uh, generally speaking, as, as far as I understand, all of these are free for personal and commercial applications, right? Um, so let's go ahead. We're gonna we're gonna look for something called one of them called Lobster. Lobster. And here we go. So click through on Lobster. And they give you all kinds of stats on the information about um, uh, you know who designed the font, a um, little bit of a history about the font, and then also style. So if you want to sample this before you use it, let's say Bill Bryson. So type out your text and sample that. You can crank it up to get a sense of what it's like.
right? You can also see the various uh, ligatures or uh, glyphs that are included with the font. Just because you've got a character on your keyboard doesn't necessarily mean that that meant that that typeface includes that character. It'll, if it doesn't, it'll have to substitute <coughs> another font. So be aware, right? Uh, so let's say, okay, yeah, I'd like to select this font. Let's let's go for this one. Um, so there are two, basically two ways to uh, to access the API, okay? And one of them is through a link, uh, an href value in a link tag. The other one is through an add import. Okay, they both basically though how we talk to the API is we pass pass in some URL parameters. And for example, in this case, I would like the font family. So there's the, the that points to the, the Google font service, and then family is lost equal lost. There's some other values we can if we want to just extract from the font, maybe just certain uh, weights, or maybe just the italics version, we can pass in these. This one doesn't, doesn't have anything of that sort. So we're going to show you, so the standard is just you put the link element up there, but what we're going to do is we're going to use, use the add import. So head over there and then copy out the add import to your clipboard. So right under step 2a, paste that at import. It's important that when you're uh, importing fonts, treat those like a dependency. Those need to come before we start getting into CSS rules. right? So we're at importing any kind of assets. That has to be at the top. Comments notwithstanding, that has to be before your other CSS rules. Step 2a. So now what we're going to do is we're going to set Lobster as the first font in the stack for the author's name. So right now we're using uh, impact is what's, is what's rendering. So we're going to change that. Now what we call this, we have to, we have to look at this here. That's what we need to call it. Exactly that, right? Okay. Um, and really, like, how does this work? What is the deal with this? I want you to copy this URL. I want you to head into a browser. And take a look. So how this works is it actually generates a font face rule uh, as hosted on the fonts.googleapis.com on their cloud-based service. So it defines the font face. It gives the font family. This is the, this is the hook. That's what we need to call it in our CSS. Whatever they've called it here. We can't make up some name because we didn't author the at font face rule. This, the API did. So that's what we need to call it. Capital included. right? Um, you notice we're downloading. And we're downloading, it's interestingly enough, uh, it's pulling down <coughs> one, two, three, four different font sets. So it's probably pulling down more than we want, right? But each one of these, um, so it's, uh, it will also include Unicode characters for rendering. So you need to uh, basically limit. If you go down here, you can go to the, the customize here, and we can maybe just, I'm not sure why those, um, interesting, I'm not sure why those came up in the font face, or maybe it's only pulling in certain characters, but, uh, you know, there will also be maybe different weights that you want to pull in. Only pull in what you're needing, what you need. Don't pull in more, because you're just adding to your page weight. So be mindful of what uh, the font is including when you just pull that from the API. And say load time fast, right? They used to have a little kind of a speed clock there to show you how fast it came in, but all right. So off we go. So then that's cool. 
Well, let's head down to step two. Let's set lobster here, save that. And all things being equal, Bill Bryson at the top. Good, um, but not great. So we'll come back and fix that. We'll make it great. Don't worry. Step two, step and uh, step three. <coughs> Okay, so the script for the script part of the font. So let's go here and take a look at our model. This here, that's quite an interesting typeface. Um, can I get something that looks sort of kind of like that? Well, um, the neat thing is you can. What you can do is you can leaf through. Uh, you can leaf through here. Let's go back to the the home page here, and we can limit that to handwriting fonts. Right, um, uh, 128 of 846 font families. Right, remember it's not just a font family. It may include um, a, a bold or a heavy. It may include a, a light version. These are actually different vectors. It's not that. So if, uh, if you put font weight bold, sometimes the browser is just adding, just rendering. So it's, it's fake bold. It's not really a bold character. A bold character actually needs to be designed separately from the normal weight or the regular weight, the Roman character. Um, or, and the italics is actually a different glyph. It's not just slanted uh, Roman, right? So font families could include uh, a number of different fonts. And so we can leaf through this and try and find this one that might be reasonably similar. I don't know. Um, but there's a lot. To leaf through, and this this list is growing, so it's uh, um, it's pretty cool. Chances are you might be able to find something that is pretty darn close. Now, if our job, if our job is if we're working in an, in, a, in a in an organization where they have official fonts, so their style guide says, no, no, you need to use Optima for all headings, subheadings, for uh, any, any you know, navigational labels, all this kind of thing. They'll be very prescriptive. You have to use Optima. You can't use something that kind of looks close to it. You've got to use it. That's the style guide. It's a corporate style guide. That's your job, right? Um, that's already been, you know, you have to be creative in other ways, not with the font. Um, so let's just say, let's go to another uh, interesting resource. We're going to go to uh, Font Squirrel. So dial up Font Squirrel. Should be the first hit, and there you go. This is a fantastic tool. So Font Squirrel um, also features a lot of free fonts as well. That doesn't absorb, uh, absolve you of the responsibility to check and see what do they mean by free. <clears throat> Just because I don't pay for it doesn't necessarily mean I can use it on a commercial web application. Maybe it's free if I'm using it on a personal context, but not in a corporate context. So you have to look at the, the licensing fees. Um, so I want you to, whoop, where are we going here? No, I don't want that. Click on, oh, they got me with that. They tricked me. All right, type in here, uh, honey <coughs> script. What's that? <coughs> oh, it's in Defont. Oh, did I did I misread my code? Okay. Oh, <laughs> I put it right in the instructions. Read the instructions. Just read the instructions. <laughs> yes, don't go to Font Scroll yet. I digress. You won't find it there. There we go. So, thank you. <laughs> font Scroll is going to sit around. They're going to chug away trying to find that font. Um, this is pretty darn close. Is it the exact font um, on my, um, is it precisely and exactly that? I don't know. If you look at um, compare a character, can you test drive this thing? Look, look at the L. So there's the L on the font and there's, uh, 
It's close. It's not bad. It's the best approximation that I could find without actually learning from the designer of this great book cover um, what font they used. Um, so, but I'll, 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 tell you, I'll tell you a little bit about how I discovered the actual font for some of the faces used on this book. So let's use that. Let's go ahead. Um, let's take a look at this Honeyscript, for example. Um, <coughs> click on the download, honeyscript.zip. That'll go into our downloads folder, that's fine. I'm going to drag this to the desktop. Extract the zip archive, otherwise you're going to get weird. Okay, So what you've got is a couple of uh, fonts here called uh, Honeyscript Light and Honeyscript Semi-Bold. I only want the light one. I don't even need the other one, so I'm not even going to use both of these. Um, this is called a true type font, TTF. So there are different font uh, formats um, for different machines, for different operating systems. True type fonts, um, that format's been around for a long time. Um, there's also a, a font called uh, EOF, embedded open type. Uh, OTF, open type format. There's SVG, scalable ve vector graphics can also be used to build fonts. Um, WAF, web open font format. Um, and so in the past, so many of these different user agents use different formats. So we have to kind of figure out how do I provide that in the various formats that everyone's machine is going to use. I can't just throw up a true type font and hope that uh, iPhone 6 is going to pull that up. Good luck. right? And that's important, right? Because we're designing for mobile first now. So anyway. That's true. The other thing I want to talk about, we go back to the, the, the homepage on defont.com. I want you to go down to the very bottom here. I don't know if you can, you probably can't see that on the screen. I'll zoom it up. Zoom the whole, no, can I zoom it up? Go, go, go. No, I'm not going to be able to. Ah. I get to, can I see the footer on the screen? I've zoomed it up too much. No. Anyway, um, the fonts presented on this website are their author's property and are either freeware, shareware, demo versions, or public domain. So they make no assurances to you of that. The license mentioned above, the download button, is just an indication. Please look at the README files in the archives or check the indicated author's website for details and contact him if in doubt. If no author license is indicated, that's because we don't have information. That doesn't mean it's free. So it's your responsibility, right? Um, so if we go here to, uh, let's go back here. Can I pull up, where is the, oh, Dieter, let's go to Dieter Stefman. Here's the, uh, at stefman.de and someone, uh, I was posting through his blog here, someone asked, hey, uh, he even looks like a, a typographer. When I think of a typographer, that's what I think of. God like that. Anyway, um, someone even here said, uh, does your free fonts mean that they are completely free or there are limitations? Thank you. The fonts are free for private use only. That means if I want to use Honeyscript on a corporate web application, I'm either going to have to get special permission from the typographer or pay him, or I'm stuck, or I just can't use it. Those are, those are the situations. It's your job to figure that out. Right? Just because you found this font for free on the web does not give you the right to use it in any context you wish, particularly if you're working for an organization. Then it really is incumbent on you to check out, am I allowed to use this font? Right? We can technically do it. doesn't mean we can legally. So that's really important. All right. Thanks, Dieter. Um, so we're going to use it in an educational context, right? But please do not use Honeyscript in a context that is commercial, right? Unless you contact Dieter and ask him, then no, that's, that's not the case. So anyway, so I'll give you a quick break at, at, since it's 3 o'clock. Go and get your afternoon coffee. 
Um, then we'll come back and we'll show you how to, how, to, how to take this font and generate all the different formats we need, embed it on the page so we can use it reliably everywhere. Okay? Cool. Go get, your, go get yourself a coffee, take a quick break. And we'll be back, let's just say 10 hours. Put this on pause. Okay, we're back. All right, let's see how to wrangle this. this uh, let's get, see how to get this font working everywhere, on everything. Okay, so how we do that, we've, um, we download the font. Um, but what we need to do is, because the font only includes um, a, a, a true type, we, we just want the light version of the font. So I can actually get rid of the semi-bold. I don't want to include that because I'm not going to use it. So blow, blow this away. Honeyscript light true type font. A true type font is not going to work on all platforms. So what I need to do is I need to, uh, first of all, check that I, am I licensed to use this font? And, and if, if the case is, and we know this is only for personal use, so in this case, being a, a, an educational environment, we won't use this beyond uh, what we're doing here. So what, what I want you to do now is head over to Font Squirrel. You'll see here there is something called a generator. This is a fantastic tool. This is really good. So go to the generator at Font Squirrel. So what this does is it says, it says, look, um, you need to tell us that the fonts you're uploading are legally eligible to be embedded in a web page. So not only does the font, do you need to be licensed to properly use the font, but if the font is licensed by the font, font foundry or the designer only for print use, like if they say, yeah, you can use it commercially, but only for print, not for web. The challenge is for web, um, if I take this font and I put it on my server, I'm distributing the font, right? That's, the, that's long been the challenge about web fonts is not so much using the font because one person's using it, they're just using it to view a web page, big deal. But if we put the font on our own server, now we're saying, public, here's the font. Have at it, right? Enjoy, download, right? Now the author or the foundry who spent that time, energy, and money building the font, right? How are they going to get paid? So that's been the problem. So you have to make sure also that the, the font you're, you're buying is licensed for web font as a web font. So for web embedding, that's very important, okay? Check that out, check the font foundry, check the terms of license wherever you're using this stuff. And you know, likely it's going to cost you money, but that doesn't matter because in the organization you're working with, you build that into the budget for whatever you're doing. That's just, just, a, that's just a hard cost of doing business, right? That's fine, just make sure you're licensed to do it. So we're gonna say, yes, we are, let's say for today, yes, we have, uh, the ability to do that. We'll click on the upload fonts button. And where do I put this? In the desktop here, Honeyscript. Find the TTF for Honeyscript Lite. Open that. It'll chug away for a minute. You can choose basic, optimal, or expert. We'll give you all kinds of different. Um, and then you can say download your kit. So you download this. Takes a second or two. We're all hitting up the font, same font service at the same time, obviously. So then you'll get a zip file. And the zip file will have a web font kit. Um, extract that. And then you'll see um, a, few a few files will be generated. There'll be a style sheet here. Uh, there'll be a, a generator config. Um, there's a demo. You can actually fire up the demo.html page and it'll show you the font actually on a page rendered. This is not an image. That is, those are real font characters. 
Okay? Uh, you can look at a sample layout. You can see different glyphs for different, uh, what are included for different languages for this particular font. Not all fonts are created the same. Uh, and you can see there's a, a tab here called Installing Web Fonts. So you can see here the font face uh, rule. They generate this uh, for you here. So we'll copy this. Head back to our code. Now, what we want to do is we need to actually move. Uh, I have already done this for you, but you would move the HoneyScript Lite web font WAF and WAF2 here uh, into a fonts folder. So you'd actually host those web, web open font format files here. Let's go back here. Do they? Yeah, so they're only including the WAF and the, the uh, WAF and the WAF2 files. Okay? Um, That's okay. So, anyway, let's go back here to. So go to the sorry, go to the um, where they they the HoneyScript Lite demo on the package that you downloaded, and under installing fonts, copy the at font face rule there. And we'll paste that. That's a fair bit of typing, so we'll. Put that into our paste that. So a couple of things. Um, <clears throat> this here, this stack, the, the way the at font face works, we want to treat this kind of like an at import, and that this is a uh, this is a, a dependency. So we want to have this defined before we actually use this the uh, the font itself in a font family stack elsewhere in our CSS. Um, the, the way this works, however, is we give this a name, right? So we decide ourselves, uh, different than the Google API, Google API they, just, they name, name it for you. Now we're writing the at font face rule so we can decide what we want to call it. So I'm going to call it Honey Script Light. Now, um, what we've got here is kind of, this is kind of a history lesson in the sense that um, it used to be that we had to supply all of these, we had to supply an embedded open type version of the font. We had to uh, also supply a, um, uh, another rule that just dealt with some weirdness in IE for embedded open type. We had to actually pass it a mind type to the format. That was weird, but we had to do it. Then we put, if that, so if, if, and then this is, this, this order was built in such that things would fail out gracefully, right? And so if you couldn't do that, couldn't use that. They don't use the web open font format. That was great. Generally, I think <coughs> Firefox was the ones that were the ones that kind of uh, originally supported that and then got people onto it. Then we have a true type font, TTF, and failing that, uh, things like Safari Mobile wouldn't use anything except an SVG. So this here was, years ago, the best way to serve up web fonts so that every device, every platform, every browser rendered the font, forced us to generate all these different versions of the same font. Thankfully, things are getting a little bit better. What we can do is we can um, now just get down to web open font format WAF and WAF2. So what has happened over the last little while, <clears throat> um, and then we want, we'll change this to WAF2. So we can get rid of this other stuff. And now, of course, we need the path here to the, f the font 
So in here, we need to go up one directory from our, from our custom, just like referencing an image from your CSS. We have to go up back into the root folder, into the fonts directory. So I need to go fonts slash, and then I need to type out honey script dash <coughs> light dash web font. And then I'll do the same for <coughs> I'll hide that so you can see it. So <coughs> our font face now rule defines, um, first of all, it defines our, at the very least, we have to just give it a, uh, give it a name that we can, work. this is the name for us to refer to this font elsewhere in our own CSS. Then we need to say, where's the source, where are the source files for this font? First, we start with web open, form, uh, uh, web open font format, comma, and then the second URL path is to the WAP2. That seems to be emerging as the kind of de facto every browser, mobile, desktop, or otherwise seem to be moving towards support of web open font format. Sounds reasonable. Sure, is a little easier than what we what we had used to have to put in there. So save that. So if everything's cool, and this this um, bear in mind, look at make sure this here that you've got a comma, not a semicolon, right? The source here is uh, two values separated by a comma, and then then uh, uh, ended with a semicolon. So watch that. There's a little bit of a gotcha there. This is a semicolon here. If that's cool, everything's working there. <coughs> then down at around line 83, we're going to set HoneyScript Lite as the first font in the stack for the header H1. So we'll set now, and we also now, because we've introduced a space into the font name, we have to surround that with quotes. So on line 84, let's use that. That, that has to be exactly and precisely what you called it in your at font face rule. Save that. And if everything's cool, <coughs> we should have script. Okay? If it's not, a couple of things to check. Look at your at font face syntax. Okay. If it's not working, check this. It's very unforgiving. <coughs> well, that's not it. That's, uh, that's for my sign painter. Uh, it's up. Make sure the font family name is exactly and precisely what you called down below. Semicolon, source, colon, URL, make sure that path indeed matches. I already put that in there for you into, into the fonts folder. You have to go up one directory, relative path into the fonts, and then grab honeyscript light web font dot w o f f, close the brackets, format WAF, comma, <laughs> then fail back to WAF2. What is the format? Yeah, I mean W O F F. What does that mean? It means web open font format. So it's a new, it's it's a relatively new kind of like we used to have like on your system. You'll probably have a lot of true type fonts. Is that a Windows machine? Yeah. A lot of those fonts. If you go into your fonts, um, uh, so if I go in here and say uh, fonts, for example. Um, a lot of these fonts will be, you can see that's a uh, true type. A lot of your operating system fonts will be true type. They needed something, 
they needed kind of like a, a common standard, some common ground for font formats that would work well across user agents on the open internet, on the web. So that kind of emerged. There were some battles between embedded open type, open type, forma, type format, yeah. And WAF seems to be, and WAF 2 seems to be kind of emerging as the way to go. Good question. Um, yeah, if you want to know more about the, the, the intricacies of how, you know, what makes one font format different, you at that point have to talk to a typographer. Right? That's their job. That's kind of where our job starts to kind of stop and their job begins. Uh, <clears throat> so if that's all working right, make sure this path is correct. That's the, the biggest gotcha here. Make sure this is a comma. Make sure you've called it exactly that down below. Where did I put it? Hmm, where did I put it? Ah, must have been further down. Yeah, so make sure you've, and put that in quotes, because if there's a space in that name, that's when you have to quote it, because you need it to be treated as one string. Okay, cool. Step three. On to step four. Okay. Now we need a different one. So um, we're going to use the uh, Comica title font. So this is um, this is a font that actually Font Squirrel they host this uh, particular font. This is the font we're going to use to get um, this particular font here. <coughs> and it's pretty darn close. So if you keep that here, and we head over to uh, Font Squirrel. And you search in here you, uh, with a K comica. And I want comica title. Okay. It's a slightly oblique font, right? Slightly, if you look at the um, here, no, not that one. This is, is slightly, you could call it italicized. Italics and oblique are actually two different font characters. Um, yeah, I don't know. Pretty close, right? You can test drive it. A memoir. Compare that with. <coughs> Grr, come on. Ah, this is a little bit more, but that's pretty close. That's pretty close, right? <clears throat> so we'll go with that. I'll put this tab back where it belongs. That's cool. So click on the web font kit. Now you'll notice when you're pulling down, instead of uploading your own font, when you're pulling one down from the font scrolls uh, kind of collection of fonts, you have some uh, options here. You can subset this uh, language, right, as well. So you don't need all the characters in, uh, you can get basic Latin or no subsetting, which can download all the characters for the font. I'll leave that uh, default now. Your font format, you can choose just the web open font format. You can include true type font, embedded open type, and SVG if you want. And again, it depends. If you're, if you're supporting uh, maybe some older <coughs> mobile devices on Safari, uh, maybe you want SVG in there. Think about your audience, right? Um, for forward-looking uh, font uh, embedding, we'll just use WAF. So download the at font face kit. And there's my download, so extract that. Okay. So in, and then they'll like put it in a web fonts folder, and you'll see that they've got the regular, the axis, the caps, the paint, the wide regular, right? So you got all of this stuff. So we just want the regular font in here, and here they only give us the Comica title web font dot um, So for your convenience. In the lesson files, I've already put that Comica title web font dot in there for you. So it's, you have to move that file in there. Um, 
any words of wisdom from Font Squirrel, uh, you could usually you could go into the title demo that they, they'll give you a, again, and they'll give you an installing web fonts, some sample, and the font specimen itself. Same thing, okay? <coughs> so that's okay. All we want, though, all we're going to be using is the WAF, not the WAF two, just the WAF. So we can just grab, we'll, we'll instead of uh, reinventing the wheel, we'll co copy this here. And we'll change this. We only want WAF, so I'll get rid of, uh, I'll get rid of this, put a semicolon at the end here, whoops. And it's just called Comical Title. Watch your case. Oh no. Comica capital title uh, dash web font dot waf. <clears throat> so take a lot, take great care. Of course, we have to call this something else, or that won't work. We want to call it <clears throat> Comica title regular. And you have to be very when you're dealing with a font family, we're only using one of these, right? So be specific. So make sure you bolt together that font face rule there. Save that. Let's go to step four. B, set Comica title regular as the first font to stack for the phrase a memoir. So that is their header, H1EM. Is it indeed? Don't take my word for it. Header, H1. Header. Oh, where's my wrap? View. Where's wrap? Header, H1EM. Right there. So we're targeting that one with the selector. And this will will leave the impact as a fallback. Comica title regular. Tricky, very tricky. You mess up one, you mess up one comma or semicolon. The whole thing comes crashing down, right? You have to be, you have to sweat the small stuff here. They work great when they work. When they don't work, they don't work. Let's check it out. Uh, got a whole bunch of stuff open here. I need to clean up my, clean up my mess. Uh oh. Reload my page. And there you can see a memoir behind the image here is indeed. the font I'm looking for. <clears throat> Step five. So now, for the author's name and for the title of the book, I did something very interesting. Um, so what I did is I said, I said, I'd like to get the exact and precise font that was actually used to make this book cover. What is it, right? I couldn't. I I, I leafed through font repositories all over the place trying to find this. Finally, I couldn't find it at all, and I I kind of sort of gave up. So I went to something called What the <coughs> Font, right? So this is a really cool. Um, So what I did was I, up, I took a picture of the, I, I extracted just this, went into Photoshop, cut this, thun, this phrase Thunderbolt Kid, and I uploaded it to what the font, right? Sometimes the, uh, it will work and it will actually pull up, it will scan that through OCR and actually determine uh, through optical character recognition what the font is. This one did not work. 
So it actually then went to a panel of people who uh, volunteered their time. These are just typographers who are just, they're not so about fonts, right? And they came back to me and they said, oh yeah, we know what that font is. Head over to, so it's a font foundry called House Industries. And if we go to the fonts here, I wouldn't have found this on my own, no way. Um, what is it called? A um, sign painter. And there it is. That is the exact and precise font that was used to design this book by the graphic designer. So I said, oh, OK, well, that's cool. Um, yeah, I, I like that font. Buying options. Um, I don't want desktop. I want uh, upright or web. $125. Okay, I have to buy it for web, and it's it's licensed for web. This is great. The only problem was I was like, I'm not really using it for a website. I'm using it in an educational context to teach you guys. So I called them up. I said, hey, we're going to be using this font for a web font embedding class, in an advanced CSS class. Could we use that in this capacity? And they said, yeah, we don't really have a, our licensing really doesn't cover that. I said, yeah, I know, it's kind of weird. I said, but we're just going to be using it in the class. We're not even going to be using it. It's not even going to show up on a production or a public server, really. Uh, if it does, it's just, it's, just a, it's an assignment, right? And they said, OK, let us get back to you. And they got back to me, and they charged us, I think it was about $75. And they said, you can use this ad infinitum as much as you want, as long as it's just in the class. So please, do not take this font and use it in another context. You'll get me in big trouble, and they'll get mad at me. And that's not cool. Okay, so I, I did this for you. So we went in. I I paid this out of my program budget because I said that's really cool. Let's actually use the font from the actual Foundry and see how this works. So we did. We got that, and they they I, I paid them their money. They happily they were very very helpful. And here is the font. If we go into um, the fonts directory, they provided me with the WAF and the WAF two versions of Sign Painter House Upright. They gave me. The exact fonts. I didn't even have to go through a generator or anything. Here is the license as well. So they actually provided also a, a uh, it's probably a boilerplate license document, but, but uh, interesting nonetheless, covering how we are permitted to use this font. Right? So feel free to look at that. It gives you a sense of the legal challenges behind doing this, right? It, it, it's a legal matter. It's not so much a, a technology matter. You can embed just about any font if you have the right face. It's a legal matter, right? So so anyway, um, also, if we look in here, let's go to the fonts. I've also included, uh, when they sent this with me, they sent a bunch of recommendations just specific to, uh, I mean, they engineered <laughs> these fonts. This, these fonts are software. They, the, the, the very talented people here at this, at this foundry edited this and they said, look, a couple of things. Um, here's, here's, how, here's how we want you to bolt together the, uh, uh, the font face rule. Okay? And they included a couple of other things that they want us to do. Um, one of them is they want you to, to use text rendering optimized legibility to make sure that the kerning is correctly applied in all browsers. Huh? These are high-end fonts. Like these are these are really 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 well built fonts. The designer of these fonts put together a kerning table where they calculated the the differences in um, how close individual characters of different combinations might be to provide a consistent kind of color to the font. It's called a kerning table. It takes hundreds of hours, right? So in order for the browser to use those native kerning tables for the browser, we have to do. They would like you to set this in the CSS. Read this stuff, man. Just read the instructions. If they're telling you to do this, they're not fooling around. Just do it. Um, now, also, they want you to do. Um, uh, they want you to start with the WAF two, and fall back to the WAF. Um, I think I got the other, the earlier example wrong. I think I should have started with the WAF two and then fall back to the WAF one, or the WAF. Um, but um, the other thing too, if you're using each font separately. 
um, use the style and weight shown, right? Um, so they give you a, a, a number of things. Um, so, and then they show you an example of how, how to use this um, in terms of, uh, we'll talk a little bit about kerning and, uh, and font variant, uh, or font feature settings. Um, but what I want you to do is then just take this here out of the uh, re recommendations from uh, House Industries. We'll use that. And I think I already put it together um, for you, or I, I forgot to. Uh, uh, except five, yeah. So it's already kind of bolted in there too. So, um, so we did the same thing. So I set the font weight to, to 400, right? Font weight uh, can be set anywhere from zero to 900, I believe, is, is the weight. So it's just a different way of specifying weights. But um, also font stretch. This is, um, it's not what you think. Font stretches, if you look at your um, uh, fonts, you know how you have Arial and Arial Condensed? Uh, let's go to my fonts here. Um, my system fonts. <coughs> Um, oh, they don't have Arial Condensed. Uh, condensed. Let's search up Condensed. Condense. So there's, um, yeah, so they've got uh, different, uh, if a font has a, in the family, has a variant that is uh, condensed, what, what the font stretch says is you can use that, that Use that instead. So, for example, um, oh, they're not pulling up the examples. Like, yeah, I, I I haven't used that very much. But what they're saying is um, normal. Oh, there you go, normal and narrower. Um, what they're saying is set it to normal because we don't want anything. We don't want the browser to be uh, doing anything different. Um, if this is the font you're using, <coughs> use that font. So don't use a condensed or anything like that. Cool. So save that. Uh, so that's step 5A. Let's go over to step 5B. And then replace the lobster with sign painter <coughs> upright. So we called it exactly sign painter upright. So I would just copy that exact. And then instead of lobster, which is the one we use from Google APIs, oops, did I break something? So get rid of lobster and replace that with sign painter upright. And if everything's cool, <coughs> where did I put my, ah, where did I put it? There it is. <coughs> Bill Bryson should now be pretty darn close to that. <coughs> because it's the right font. That's it. That's the real. It's the real deal. Um, okay, that's cool. We'll deal with the sizing later. Um, next thing, of course, we want to deal with Thunderbolt Kid, which is kind of out of control here, right? Let's head over and deal with that. Um, step five, A. Step five, B. So now we want to deal with the H1 Strong, which is the Thunderbolt Kid. So we'll put this at. <coughs> as well. Add that to the font family stack Whoops. for header h1 strong. Falling back, there's no, it is important because if this fails, if something goes wrong, I want to fall back to something that's going to at least look reasonable, right? It still has to be usable. So I always, um, always fall back to a regular classification. So save that. Let's see what our book looks like now. Getting closer. Five D. Size up the font to emulate the original <coughs> design. So, um, the address, so we've set this right now at four EMs, right? 
Let's crank this up. Um, bring this up to five. So this is Bill Bryson, right? Now, I want you to notice something. Every time I do this, bring this up to six. It's getting bigger, but other things are getting affected on the page. Bring this up to, um, let's go to 6.25. I think is where I, <clears throat> through experimentation, figured it was pretty close. <coughs> pretty close. <clears throat> now, um, what are the problems with using M? EM. So that means um, basically take the font size of the current element and multiply it. Or uh, by 6.25, right? The problem is that this is it. it um, uh, if you have an, if if you're using m inside another element and that element is itself 1.5 m, it's then 6.25 times 1.5 times whatever the font is. So it, it's cumulative. It gets out of control. One of the things we can do is we can actually instead of using m, we can use a, a newer <laughs> measurement called rem, which means root m. So instead of dealing with how m is, is constantly looking for a parent and multiplying that and getting that compound multiplication kind of factor in, we can set everything to refer to one font size on the root of the page. So what we do is we go up here uh, and see how we set the font size here on the, on the body? <coughs> we can cut that and we can set it Instead, on the HTML element. That's cool. And then anywhere I'm using a, an M, I can change this. For example, um, I can change 6.25 to rem. Okay. Now, using rem, that means 6.25, and it will always refer back to the root right here. So it's 6.25 times 120%. So now if I can go down here, it just allows me to get sidestep that compounding factor that has when you put m's within m's within m's, right? Um, it's, a, it's a little bit more predictable, for lack of a better word. So. Um, we can uh, do things like the, the height of the element. We can change that's in M's. I can change that to rems. Right? <coughs> maybe that's, uh, yeah, maybe that should be something like, uh, let's go to three. Still have to bring that up. Let's say, I don't know, let's say six, six EM, six rem. Not quite. Eight rem. Okay. But doing it this way means that, truthfully, now I can, if I wanted to scale up or down the typography or anything that had to do with type, like I've got one dial on the HTML. I can just adjust that one setting here, and everything will uh, scale up predictably, right? Um, anyway, so let's go five, step five, one of five, B, five D, right? Now we want to fix the header, or is it the hate? For the strong, so this one needs to, <coughs> Let's change this one to rem. So the header h1 strong, change this, uh, which is, in fact, the Thunderbolt kid. We need to get this going. So header h1 strong, we change this to rems. Now things start to kind of get back into shape. And I'm going to say, I don't know, maybe that should be 5 rem.
pretty close. If I compare that with <coughs> cool. <clears throat> M versus rem. Root M versus our regular understanding of M. Um, now we need to go to step six. Font kerning. So one of the interesting things here is that uh, <clears throat> kerning tables are defined by the person who designed the font. So um, if I leave this to uh, the default, which is auto, what I'm doing is I'm leaving those kerning decisions, uh, the decision in terms of how, um, <coughs> so how close the R might be to an E, for example. I'm leaving that to the browser. If I set this to uh, cur font kerning normal, what this does is it actually says, OK, let's refer to those native kerning tables as intended by the typographer or the foundry that Look in the software, look in the font itself for the, that kerning information. The sad thing is, that sounds great. Um, the, the problem, from my understanding, is that this is limited to open type font, <coughs> OTF, not web open font format, as far as I understand. Now, that may change. Browsers are getting better and improving on that. Yep. Welcome to my life for the past 20 years. Like, <laughs> like I, that's the story of my career. You know, ah, oh, you can have this, but it only works in Netscape Navigator. You can't have it in IE. But everyone's on IE. I know, but you know, that's yeah, I, yeah. You just you just described the last 20 years of my career right there. I, I don't. It is getting better. It is it is improving. We, like we 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 we're faster now at I think adopting interoperable standards and browser vendors are better now at sitting at the same table instead of battling over who has supremacy over the browsing world. We, we, we do collaborate better and these things do move along better. I don't know. So this, what they're saying is, uh, the Font Foundry itself, host, is saying, if you put this in, this will handle uh, the kerning tables. This will, this, this, may, this will force the browser to respect the kerning tables for our font <coughs> if that doesn't work. Um, I, yeah, um, I, I, I like to see this. At least I don't have to put a, put a weird, um, you know, I don't have to do something like this. Like we're getting away from, not equal, sorry. We're getting away from vendor prefixes, I find. Those are, those are falling off the map really quickly, which is good, so. This is not really a big problem. You can just run it for a prefixer and it does not have a new You can, sorry? You can run it for a prefixer. Yes. You can, and um, so things like uh, uh, SAS and LESS will take care of a lot of that for you, or your or your prefixers. You can just yeah. you can write you can write compiled CSS, punch it through there, and they'll generate all that stuff for you. There is that, which makes life a little easier. I agree with that. Um, so, but but before we get into prefixing, you have to understand why you would put this in here. So these both, in some in not so many ways, kind of do a similar function. Kerning. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So step step B. They're saying uh, apply this. Um, as far as I understand, this only works for open type font. Uh, but stay tuned. That may work. Like a day may come where the browser vendors are like, okay, no, we're, we've all agreed that web open font format is kind of the best for web. Uh, maybe we should allow this font kerning property to for the browsers to use then the kerning tables for that font, whatever it is. So there you go. Cool. And there you have it, right? All of this, all of this stuff here, the whole page, web typography, right? Gone are the days when graphic designers 
had all the power, right? CSS and website box. There you go. Okay. Um, that's really super cool. So I've got a really uh, super cool challenge for you. I think you'll really enjoy. Um, let's head back here. Oh, where did I go? Oh, here, here it is. Okay. So Lab Six. Here's what here's what Lab Six looks like. This is kind of cool. So I want you to. Uh, I'm going to give you a piece of HTML, a really simple piece of HTML. I want you to pick one of these, just one. Okay. I want you to change the H1 in the HTML and make it look like that, or that, or that. As close as you can get. I want, I mean, I want, change the letter spacing, change the line height, you know, make sure you use a border bottom in here, get the right, exactly the right color. Try and get it so it looks identical, as close as you can. I don't know if it's possible, but I want to see you get close as you can. I've provided these images, this little background image here, this one, and this one, and also these two images here for the background. So you can apply uh, two backgrounds on this one if you want to go for the star. I've provided all that. You don't have to hunt around the internet. I want, what I want you to do is hunt around for the fonts and see how close you can get. Use at font face and get it to work. Okay? It's, it, it's not, it, it seems, sounds relatively easy. It's not. It's hard. It's really hard to do. Okay. So just choose one. If you want, if you get, you can figure one out really quickly. That's cool. You can do another one. Uh, but at minimum, do that. So uh, I've provided you with all those graphics. Um, uh, so you download the provided HTML. I'll show you what that looks like. Um, so pull down lab file six dot zip. I'll extract those out. <clears throat> no, it's not gonna, not gonna, there it is, is it? Oh, there it is. Okay, here, yeah. So here it is. There's your go. I want you to manipulate this. Type in the newspaper name right here, right? Build me a custom piece of custom CSS, and in the custom CSS, I want you to write the um, uh, add font face rule in there. Okay, background colors, sample. Try and get the right yellow or the right blue. Try and get it just right. Um, what else did I give you? I'll show you. No, where is it? Oh, lab six files. Here you go. So inside the images here, there's all the assets you'll need for any one of those. Cool. And your custom styles go in the CSS. All right. Uh, oh, here, let me send these around. And I will, I will pause this video and get this uploading to YouTube. <coughs> Thanks, everyone. Module 6.